I'll go, hey, I'm Drew Endy, and I'm supposed to talk about looking for alien messages in terrestrial DNA, which is not what I work on. And so please consider my remarks to be those of um, an independent, um, optimist, skeptic, and um, appraiser, if you will. Um, and it's hard to think about this following both Stephen's talk and David's talk because it basically is going to come down to the puzzle of communication of meaning and intention. Um, my answer to this question is going to be yes uh, at the end, and so I'll give you that ahead of time, but, but for a variety of reasons. So let's see. Good. So, so things I am not willing to argue about because I cede this to all of you, your experts. Um, ETs exist somewhere. I'll just take that to be okay. And things move around among heavenly bodies. I'll take that to be okay too. I'm not arguing about that. Argue about that with all the experts here. Um, I think about this from a communications theory perspective in a very classical sense. So somewhere there's an information source. It means to transmit a message that's encoded. Uh, there's a channel. There's a noise source impacting the message in the channel. It's received and then decoded, interpreted. And classically, when you think about SETI and, and things like that, you've got puzzles on the right-hand side around receiving and decoding having to do with are you in the right location to receive the message? Are you in the right time to receive the message? And are you capable of interpreting the message, decoding it, and making meaning of the signal that's coming in? Um, this is not always easy, obviously, right? So again, people here are more expert in this than I, but when I was doing diligence on this, I returned to some old anecdotes around how it's hard to predict sometimes where things are going to be in space when they move around, because apparently the orbits and trajectories of things, which you think of as being regular on tens of millions of years, may in fact turn out to be chaotic. And uh, OK, so what's the plan for communication if the message takes some time to get there, and while you're sending that message, the things you're trying to get to are moving around in ways you can't perfectly predict? And the answer is obvious in different ways. One type of answer is make sure your message is going everywhere, and maybe make sure it's persistent with respect to time as well. And we've encountered situations like this uh, throughout our own human experiences. One way of communicating messages where you don't know exactly where the recipient is is you just will put the message everywhere. You drop leaflets, or you have ad words, or you create uh, things that pre-position the message in places where people will stumble upon them. And um, you appeal to behavior and how the recipients might act in order to get inevitable reading and decoding. Right? We're quite good at this now in, 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 in sort of the modern way uh, we operate. So building on this so far, I'm then willing to make some arguments. Uh, just think about what Steve, uh, what David was communicating, uh, where we are with our bio prowess and where we might be heading. Any, and then think about what, what Steve Jurvetson was distracted by a moment ago, rockets landing three at a time, apparently successfully, right? Okay, so, so what's going on there? At the moment in time, we're getting pretty good at doing things physically and listening to electrical, electromagnetic, light, signals, we're also securing a type of mastery of biology. So, so I'm going to be willing to argue that any bio-based civilization that's capable of interstellar messaging by any form will also have achieved a type of operational mastery of living matter. And by that I mean a capacity to construct living evolving systems without constraint to lineage. Just build stuff that's alive and let it run. So that's something I'm willing to argue. A second thing I'm willing to argue is somebody intending to transmit or communicate bits or atoms, given options, will choose among available options and maybe try lots of things in parallel if they can afford it. And then a fifth thing I'm willing to argue is that living systems also auto-generate a type of self-love, a type of molecular and emotional narcissism that we're always willing to uh, see interactions and reflect them back. and make these recurring patterns that amplify. Um, the reason I find this one interesting is what would motivate somebody or something to send a signal or a message or an information or, a, or, a, or a, a set of material? So what purpose would that be? And what would we do if we, if we took that up? I'm also obviously trying to set up the panel tomorrow as, as we might discuss this further. So here's a tour of the limited history 
around looking for messages in terrestrial DNA coming from elsewhere. One of the points of departure has been referenced is this article from Crick and Orgel around directed panspermia. Life on Earth exists because it was sent here in a directed way. Um, one of my favorite figure ones of any research paper. Uh, here is the present in billions of years. Here's the formation of life on Earth as we understand it. And then of order seven billion years earlier, the origin of Earth-like planets elsewhere in the universe. And this window of time available for primary origin of life elsewhere, and then the sending of stuff here is fairly big. Six, seven plus billion years. And on the right side, they're proposing a spaceship not transmitting the more recent things David was giving us a tour of, but microbes in a tiny little package. And if it goes 60, 100,000 miles an hour, but you give it a million years, you can cover some distance. So that's the thinking circa 1977. The cool thing about imagining a biological message is if it gets here and auto amplifies and blankets the planet, you don't really need to worry about being in the right place to get it other than being on the planet. It's gonna be all over the planet. And so an example of that would be the phage, the viruses, the bacteria, uh, thought to be the most abundant living systems that replicate on bacteria, about 10 to the 30, 10 to the 31 particles per Earth, it's estimated. Um, so they're all over the place. It turns out, maybe not a coincidence, that the first terrestrial DNA genome sequenced is that of a phage. Um, the, being Phi X174, here's a schematic, a cartoon schematic of the physical particle of the phage, tens of nanometers in diameter. And uh, circa 77, this genome sequence is published. And what's interesting at first glance here at the bottom of the abstract is they're finding encoded in this terrestrial genome uh, an architecture where the DNA sequence for one gene encodes not only that gene, but if you shift the register by one letter, you get a second gene product or protein that has a totally different function. And that was peculiar because in the 1941-42 era, there was another set of experiments wherein people were able to map a single biochemical function to a single gene, the so-called one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. And so when the first terrestrial DNA genome gets sequenced and it's well, one gene, two proteins, what's up with that? And when you look at this sort of stuff, here's the primary sequence of the virus then sequenced at the time, and you can highlight one gene in black with its start and stop, and it wraps around from the bottom to the top, and then nested in here in blue is a second different gene. So the same DNA code is encoding two different polypeptides or two different proteins that have different primary sequences as amino acids and different biochemical functions, one being associated with replication of the DNA, the other being a structural scaffolding protein to help build the particle. So within two years of that showing up, our past colleagues are analyzing these information strings for messages from ET. And you might think this is a little bit, well, I don't know what you would think of it. What, I, what was amazing to me was nobody told me about this work, right, as a, as a student growing up and understanding uh, what might be happening in biology. And, and when you look into it, it's kind of interesting. That nested gene turns out to be encoded by 121 uh, codons or 121 amino acids. The square of 11, that's a prime number. Hey, what's the chance that the first genome on Earth, sequenced by human beings, encoded in DNA, has genes within genes, and the nested genes are the squares of prime numbers. Coincidence or interesting? Would you, would you like to know more? Um, <laughs> so what they did is they started exploring. And they made 11 by 11 matrices, different decoding schemes, tried to find the patterns, and concluded that they didn't find a meaningful pattern. And that's, as, that's what they reported. I think it's a very faithful scientific result, and, and that's that. Um, a few years later, you can find another example looking at a different virus, SV40. And in this analysis, they're looking for a star map encoded in triply overlapping genes, if I remember the details, and conclude that they cannot find the star map 
in the DNA, but the comment they make is the purpose here is to stress that biological media should not be ignored as a potential source of messaging from elsewhere. That's that. And, and to be really honest with you, I can't show you many more papers on this topic. <laughs> All right? And so this paper was published circa 1980 early. Okay? Now there's a big problem with bio-based messaging. There's some features, which is if you get the biology there, it can take over, it can auto-amplify, it can persist. And so you might be able to get the signal more easily. And we love biology, so we're going to be really interested in reading it, so we're motivated to look at ourselves, and maybe we'll find your message if it's your message. But there's a really big problem from a communications theory perspective. Um, so let's say on the left I've got an intelligent being somewhere who's very keen to encode messages into an evolving living system, and off it goes. And my channel has this noise source, which is called random mutation, that then feeds into evolution. I think this is gonna turn out to be a feature in that the noise source is a, is a biased noise source which will shape things in a particular way. But it is a big problem at the outset. And the reason it's a big problem is if your message shows up 100 million years later and I'm trying to decode it, and I work for David, I'm a, a postdoc in a biology lab or something like that, I'm gonna be pretty excited to find this hyper-conserved, survives the evolutionary process, sequence of genetic material that must be important for biology in some way, and I'm gonna declare that I've discovered some new novel biological function and hope that I maybe get recognized for that. Maybe I'll get a prize if it's really good. So this, this puzzle of how to transmit meaning in an evolving milieu from a communications theory perspective is, is daunting, at least at first blush when, when, I, when I struggle to think about it. When you look at the sky and the stars and search for patterns, most of us grow up in a culture where we look for the relationships among the stars. But if you're in the southern hemisphere and look into the dark areas, and it might be hard to see on the screen, perhaps some of you will see a, a llama, right? That's shaped just coming off of the, the left side and up, um, representing a different way of looking, a different frame of reference, if you will, to try and find a pattern. And what's doubly interesting is um, not only is the, the dark shape evocative of a type of meaning, but the border between the, ex the, the, the bright explicit and the dark is a type of signal. So just with that as a way of thinking, I want to return back to, to biology. So, so maybe there's a big, maybe this big puzzle uh, is, is a big opportunity for bio-based messaging. Um, how do we encode intended messages into evolving milieu in the context of a noise source and have them be intelligently received and decoded? If we could figure out how to do that, well, that'd be a pretty good thing to do. Um, but it might also let us understand a little bit more about what's happening within the natural living systems. Uh, now, one last thing to say as an aside at this point, it is true within the biology we understand today, Gary was talking about the 400, 500 gene sets needed for life. There are of order 100 genes that are conserved in those gene sets that are essential for life, and nobody on Earth has a function assigned to them. So there are conserved things which are surviving the evolutionary process that appear to be essential for life, and nobody on Earth knows what they do. So just, I wanna set that aside as maybe we should follow up on that, which we certainly should, but, but what else could we do? Um, could we encode non-evolving messages would be one possibility. Um, it's really tricky to do if you think about invoking the standard genetic code that we work with routinely because it works uh, without having to learn chemistry, which, which I defer to Stephen on. Um, but the code from an abstract sense is one of many. And so you can, without paying any attention to all the sophisticated work done around how things actually work, just start shuffling things. And, and when you shuffle the lookup table, what gets revealed is that the, the standard code, so to speak, has some far from average characteristics. For example, what fraction of the time does a mutation in the standard code at the DNA level change the amino acid? And, and, or what, what fraction of the time does it not? And it turns out that about 24% of the time, 
when you mutate a base pair, the amino acid stays the same. Whereas in a randomly generated table, uh, it would stay the same only 4% of the time. So the, the natural genetic code in which we might be looking for messages has a very non-random property. It's much more likely to not change the amino acid. Jonathan Kayez in my group has been playing around with this in a different way. What if he started depleting the table just by deleting the tRNA decoders? Could you create a situation when a mutation occurs, instead of changing the amino acid, nothing happens? The ribosome doesn't know what to do in decoding. It might stall on the mRNA and not release and therefore be slightly deleterious, such that any single point mutation in such a table, a depleted table, would be slightly deleterious, a code in which mutations would be intrinsically selected against. And what's interesting about Jonathan's example here is we're actually not changing the genetic code except to deplete the tRNA set to make less things available for decoding. In this case, you can't fit all 20 amino acids into a 64 base table and bracket every coding codon with an empty codon. So it's not perfectly insulating of mutation. To do that, you have to get rid of some of the amino acids, and I'll refer to some work we did in collaboration with Lynn Rothschild, where we showed, for example, how to make some of the biogenic amino acids without using those amino acids. In this example, we made cysteine via enzymes in which all the cysteine residues had been removed. So you can begin to unwind uh, from a 20 amino acid life set to a, a simpler life set. And if you push this in the standard table, Jonathan proposes that going down to 15 amino acids with the standard tRNA would be sufficient to surround every coding codon with a null codon. And this might be a type of limited um, insulating code from an evolutionary trajectory perspective. So who knows, maybe all of a sudden if you had a slightly more sophisticated mastery level understanding of how biology works, you'd think about finding meaning in the messages and where the messages would be conserved. And I'm certain tomorrow that people will bring forward many other ideas around if you really understood biology, where would you put the, the message? And it probably is not gonna be at the primary DNA sequence. So to conclude uh, my remarks, should we be searching for messages in terrestrial life? Not just terrestrial genomes, I'd say terrestrial life, absolutely. Um, it, there's been so much of nothing done on the topic, it's kind of baffling, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't commit to it in perpetuity, but I would think a three-year effort or something like that would make a lot of sense with modern tools. The best case scenario is maybe we find something, who knows? Um, I kind of don't care, because the worst case scenario is we learn how to encode meaning in an evolving milieu, and we might figure out some things about biology that are mysterious right now that don't make any sense except when you try and think about it this way. So that seems as a worst case scenario to be totally good enough to get organized and move out on it. Thank you very much. I simply have to report that we are going to reconvene tomorrow here at nine o'clock. We'll have a keynote presentation from Marilyn Dugstrom from TU Delft, and then a discussion following up from the remarks of the afternoon.